Our session is on financial analysis and planning. This is the first of two concluding sessions in the course that integrate aspects of the investment decision with aspects of the financing decision. We cover the purpose of the financial plan, the contents of the financial plan, and then steps in financial plan development. These steps begin with an assessment of the financial position of the firm, the definition of debt policy, determination of the asset requirements going forward, evaluation of financing options, and finally, integration of the information that's developed in the financial plan into the management control structure of the firm. The financial plan is a document that serves multiple purposes. Most important, it serves to assure that the strategic plan of the firm can be achieved. The principal barrier to a successful strategy is the ability to finance it. That is, the most creative ideas can't be achieved without securing the financing. Because of the importance of the financial plan, to achieving the organization's strategy, financial planning is often called strategic financial planning. A second purpose of the financial plan is to analyze the interactions of the financing and investment choices open to the firm. How does the selection of one asset mix influence the types and financing instruments used? For example, some assets and related business opportunities might involve more business risk than others. And as we have learned, in this situation the firm might be more likely to use debt financing. The principal document of the financial plan is actually a projection into the future. It is a pro forma balance sheet that summarizes the consequences of decisions embedded in the strategic plan. The financial plan then forms the basis for deciding which investment and financing alternatives available to the firm ought to be undertaken. As we shall see, an output of the financial planning process is information that informs determination of the required return on equity, which of course is an important component of the weighted average cost of capital or the discount rate. Finally, the financial plan provides some benchmarks against which to measure future performance. As just noted, it provides a required return on equity that must be achieved. It also provides a target balance sheet or future financial picture of the firm that the firm needs to actualize to achieve the goals of its strategic plan. The typical financial plan has at least three main pieces. It has pro forma financial statements including a pro forma balance sheet, a pro forma income statement, and a pro forma cash statement. It contains a capital expenditure plan that is required by the business strategy of the firm and the, biz and the business strategy will be described in the financial plan. And it has the planned or necessary financing to support the capital expenditure and business strategy. In the remainder of this session, we'll describe one process that could be used in financial plan development. Firms obviously use a variety of methods to create their financial plans. The method described here is just one approach, but it contains the steps and processes common to the methods applied by many firms. The steps are assessment of the financial position of the firm currently, definition of optimal debt policy, determination 
of asset requirements going forward that are necessary to support the business strategy of the firm. Evaluation of options for financing the asset requirements. And finally, integration of the information developed in the financial plan into the management control structure of the firm. The first step is to assess the firm's present financial position. This step is necessary in order to develop an understanding of how the firm has performed in the past and therefore what it might or might not be able to achieve in the future. Financial ratios are often classified into about five categories. Here is a typical categorization. Capital structure ratios, profitability ratios, ratios describing efficiency or productivity, liquidity ratios, and market value ratios. Likely you have encountered financial ratios in other courses. The text also has a good presentation of them. So here we'll focus on those ratios in each of these categories that are most useful for financial planning. That list begins with the components of DuPont analysis. DuPont analysis is also called long-run viability analysis. This analysis focuses on the return on equity of the firm as the key to financial viability. The method is to disaggregate return on equity into important components, which can themselves be studied to understand more fully the reasons for a particular level of financial performance and the ways to improve financial performance. Here is the DuPont analysis structure. Return on equity is presented as the product of some important financial ratios. The leverage ratio defined as the ratio of assets over equity, the asset turnover ratio defined as the ratio of sales or revenues divided by assets, the profit margin defined as the ratio of earnings before income and taxes minus taxes divided by sales or revenue, and debt burden which is defined as the ratio of earnings before interest and taxes minus taxes and minus interest divided by earnings before interest and taxes divided by taxes. First let's verify that return on equity is indeed the product of these ratios. We can do that by crossing out some terms in the return on equity equation. We can cross out assets in the numerator of the leverage ratio and in the denominator of the asset turnover ratio. We can cross out sales in the numerator of the asset turnover ratio and the denominator of the profit margin. And we can cross out earnings before interest and taxes minus taxes in the profit margin and in the denominator of the debt burden. What we're left with is earnings before interest and taxes minus taxes and minus interest in the numerator and equity in the denominator. So what we have is essentially in the numerator net income after the firm has paid taxes and interest divided by equity. And that's just the definition of return on equity. So we can see that the return on equity equation in DuPont analysis is indeed a disaggregation of the component pieces of return on equity. And the disaggregation allows us to do some interesting analyses 
about the reasons for a particular return on equity and the ways in which return on equity might be improved in the future. Let's also note that two component ratios of the DuPont analysis themselves comprise return on assets. That is, asset turnover times profit margin maps out return on asset. You can see that by looking up here to the component ratios of return on assets, these two, and you can see that if we just crossed out the sales in the numerator and sales in the denominator here, what we're left with is earnings before interest and taxes minus taxes divided by assets. Or we're left with earnings before interest and after taxes, if you will. So after taxes have been paid, divided by assets or the return that's paid to both the debt and equity suppliers divided by assets and that's exactly what we've been looking at as return on assets in previous parts of the course. To see how to use DuPont analysis as a way to understand the performance of the firm let's review the meaning of each of the component ratios briefly. The focal ratio in DuPont analysis is return on equity. Return on equity is defined as net income divided by equity or earnings before interest and taxes after the interest and tax payments have been made divided by equity. It's classified as a profitability ratio one interpretation of return on equity is that it's the rate of growth in equity over time. Return on equity is the focus of the DuPont analysis because return on equity is the key to financial and therefore operational and strategic success. That is, if the firm can grow equity then the firm qualifies to borrow or to raise debt funds on good terms and at good interest rates. And if the firm can grow equity and raise debt funds on good terms, then it's able to acquire the assets necessary to support its business strategy. And if it can acquire the necessary assets, it can provide the services consistent with its mission and strategic plan. One component ratio of the DuPont analysis is, is the leverage ratio. The leverage ratio is defined as assets over equity. It's classified as a capital structure ratio and it shows the benefit of using financial leverage in multiplying a particular operating result. Note that the leverage ratio is the inverse of the equity financing ratio, which is defined as equity over assets. This is a ratio we've encountered a lot in previous parts of the course. Recall that the equity financing ratio is the percent of assets financed by equity. The equity financing ratio is the complement of the debt financing ratio, which is defined as debt over assets. And you recall that the equity financing ratio and the debt financing ratio are important determinants of the firm's access to debt. Specifically, firms with higher equity financing ratios and therefore lower debt financing ratios typically have greater access to debt on good terms. A second component ratio of the DuPont analysis is asset turnover. Total asset turnover is defined as sales 
or revenue divided by assets. It's classified as an efficiency or productivity ratio and it indicates the productivity of assets in generating revenue. And specifically, the asset turnover ratio gives, gives us the number of dollars of revenue produced per dollar of assets employed. Now if we think of revenue as the essential output of the firm and assets as one type of input, production input for the firm, we can see that the asset turnover ratio is a ratio of outputs per inputs. And in that sense, it is a productivity ratio. The kinds of kind of productivity ratios you looked at in the in your economics courses. Recall that a productivity ratio typically relates a measure of output to a measure of input. An important complementary ratio to total asset turnover is age of assets, which is calculated by taking accumulated depreciation from the balance sheet and dividing by depreciation expense on the income statement. Because depreciation expense indicates the amount of depreciation recognized in one year, and because accumulated depreciation indicates the aggregate amount of depreciation expense that's been accumulated over the life of the firm, if we divide the one-year depreciation expense into the accumulated depreciation, what we're going to get is an estimate of the number of years that the firm has had its assets, or the number of years that the firm has been depreciating its assets um, off. And that is the calculation for the age of the assets. Firms with older assets will tend to have higher total asset turnovers because old assets are largely depreciated down. As assets are depreciated, the denominator of total asset turnover falls, thereby raising the total asset turnover calculation. So firms with old assets ought to show better total asset turnover ratios. In contrast, firms with newer assets will typically show lower total asset turnovers. The third component ratio of the DuPont analysis is profit margin. Profit margin is, is defined as net income divided by sales or revenue. There are actually a couple of uh, specific definitions of profit margin. One is to take the ratio of earnings before interest and taxes minus tax payments divided by sales or revenue. That version of profit margin reflects the profit rate to all investors. A second version is to take earnings before interest and taxes and to subtract off both interest payments and tax payments and to divide that by sales or revenue. And this version of profit margin focuses on the profit rates to equity investors only. Profit margin is obviously ca categorized as a profitability ratio, and it specifically indicates the percentage of revenues that are converted to profits. The last component ratio of the DuPont analysis is debt burden. Debt burden is defined as the ratio of earnings before interest and taxes minus taxes and interest to earnings before interest and taxes minus taxes. It's classified as a capital structure ratio and it shows the extent to which profits have been reduced by debt service payments, or specifically by interest expense.
A complementary ratio to debt burden is times interest earned, which is measured as the ratio of earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, or our old friend EBITDA, to interest expense. Times interest earned indicates the cash flow available to cover the interest payment. The numerator of times interest earned is the cash flow generated by the firm's operations that's available to make the interest payment. And obviously the denominator is the interest payment itself. So the ratio here is the number of times the firm generates cash sufficient to cover the interest expense. In general, firms with high times interest earned are viewed as having additional debt capacity. In this sense, times interest earned is a ratio complementary with the debt financing and equity financing ratios. Firms with low debt financing ratios, and therefore high equity financing ratios, and with high times interest earned, have particularly high additional debt capacity. The financial markets view such firms as having good credit and therefore as meriting access to debt on good terms and at low rates. As noted earlier, an important ratio composed of two of the DuPont analysis component ratios is return on assets. Return on assets is defined as the ratio of earnings before interest and taxes minus taxes to assets. It's classified as a profitability measure and it indicates the return on investment that's available to all investors or that's paid to all investors including equity investors and debt investors. The ratios described up to now are typically calculated from information on the financial statements. Hence the ratios are book value ratios. Firms and investors also need information reflecting and describing market value. So on this page we have a few of the most important market value ratios. The most important market value ratio is stock price, which you can find in the financial pages or on the internet, and which is determined fundamentally by the ratio of earnings per share or dividends divided by the discount rate minus the growth rate. The second market value ratio is the market to book ratio. We've discussed this ratio before in the course. It's defined as the ratio of stock price to book equity per share. And it indicates the extent to which the book value of the firm understates the market value. Or the extent to which the firm value has increased since the stock sales to the owners of the firm. A third market value ratio is the price earnings ratio, which is defined as stock price divided by earnings per share. The PE ratio is the conceptual inverse of the market capitalization rate or the required return on equity. A firm with a high PE ratio might be affirmed that the market <clears throat> has capitalized at a relatively low required rate of return on equity. It also might be affirmed where the market expects a high rate of growth. Here are a few other ratios that are important to the financial planning process even though they are not components of the DuPont analysis. 
First is the current ratio, which is defined as current assets divided by current liabilities, where current assets are assets that can be converted to cash within a year or that are cash already. Current liabilities are debts that have to be paid off within a year. So the current ratio indicates the dollars in current assets available per dollar of current liabilities. The current ratio is classified as a liquidity ratio. In fact, it's the most commonly evaluated or considered liquidity ratio. And it's an indicator of the short-term solvency of the firm. Hence, this ratio focuses on the, sh the short-term prospects of the organization, whereas the DuPont analysis component ratios at least taken as a whole, focus on the long-term viability of the firm. Finally, we have the payout ratio, defined as the ratio of dividends to earnings. It indicates the percent of net income that's paid out as dividends. A related ratio is the plowback ratio which is the complement of the payout ratio, or which is defined as 1 minus the payout ratio, and indicates the percent of net income that is not paid out as dividends, but rather that is retained earnings and serves to build up the equity in the firm. A measure closely related to the plowback ratio is the equity growth from plowback defined as earnings minus dividends divided by dividends. This ratio indicates the percentage of earnings that are used to grow equity. Let's use the example in the text of executive paper to see how to perform a DuPont analysis. Here are the component ratios of the DuPont analysis already calculated. Let's go to our Excel file to see how these calculations were done. We're back to our financing Excel file and we have three related worksheets. We have an executive paper balance sheet, an executive paper income statement, and then the executive paper financial ratios. So on this sheet we show the summary balance sheet data for the firm. The income statement sheet shows the summary income statement data and finally here are the calculated financial ratios for executive paper. So let's calculate a few of these financial ratios. Let's start with an important capital structure ratio, the equity financing ratio. The calculated number is 0.37, indicating that 37% of the firm's assets are financed by equity. Now this calculation was done by looking at two numbers from the balance sheet. So let's scoot over to the balance sheet and see what's in cells D24 and D15. You can see here that in cell D24 for 2002 we have shareholders equity of 540 million dollars. And in cell D15 we have the firm's assets of 1.4 billion dollars. So the ratio of equity to assets here is 0.37. Next let's calculate the current ratio. The calculated number is 1.96. Now let's see how that was arrived at. You can see the formula 
involves the ratio of two numbers from the balance sheet again, D9 and D21. So let's scoot over to the balance sheet and see in D9 we have current assets and in D21 we have current liabilities. The current ratio is defined as the ratio of current assets to current liabilities. and that ratio is 1.96. The interpretation of a current ratio of 1.96 is that the firm has $1.96 in current assets for every $1 in current liabilities. Or it has assets that can be converted to cash within a year of $1.96 for every one dollar that it has in liabilities that have to be paid off within a year. Now let's calculate an, an important efficiency ratio, the total asset turnover ratio, which by the way is also called the sales to assets ratio. The calculated number is 1.52. Recall that this ratio is defined as sales or revenue divided by assets. So to calculate this ratio we have to get a number from the income statement in the numerator and a number from the balance sheet in the denominator. So we need B4 from the income statement and D15 from the balance sheet. So let's scoot over to the income statement and B4 is revenue, which is $2.2 .2 billion. Now let's go over to the balance sheet. And D15 is assets of $1.45 billion. So the ratio of revenue to assets is 1.52. The interpretation of a total asset turnover of 1.52 is that the firm is able to generate $1.52 in revenue for every dollar in assets that it has invested. Now let's look at some important profitability ratios. Let's start with the focal ratio of the DuPont analysis, which is return on equity. The calculated number here is 0.14. Recall that the definition of return on equity is net income over equity. So to get this 0.14, we have to go to the income statement and read net income, which is in cell B10. And then we have to go to the balance sheet and read equity, which is in cell D24. So here we are on the income statement, and net income is $74.5 million. It's also calculated as earnings before interest and taxes, minus the interest payment, minus the tax payment, to give us net income of $74.5 million. And then on the balance sheet, we read equity, of $540 million. So we have the numbers that we need to calculate return on equity, which comes to 0.14. So executive paper earned a return on equity of 14% in 2002. One interpretation of that number is that executive paper was able to grow equity at a rate of 14 percent based on the book value of equity. Another interpretation is that the shareholders earned a book value return on equity of 14 percent. Now let's look at profit margin. 
the calculated number is 0 0.05 or 5 percent and here we need two numbers actually three numbers from the income statement so profit margin is defined as earnings before interest and taxes minus the tax payment divided by revenues and the result is a 5 percent profit margin a 5 percent profit margin indicates that executive paper was able to convert 5 percent of its revenues into payments that it makes to both its debt and equity suppliers now let's look at one more profitability ratio return on assets the calculated number is 0 0.08 or 8 percent return on assets is defined as income before interest and taxes minus the tax payment divided by assets so we need to go up we need to go to the income statement to get our information on earnings before interest and taxes and, and the tax payment and we go to the balance sheet for the asset amount here in the income statement we have our familiar EBIT of 166.7 million dollars minus the tax payment of 49.7 million dollars that's our numerator in the return on asset calculation and the denominator is total assets of 1.45 billion dollars so our return on assets calculation yields a an 8 percent return the interpretation is that executive paper is able to earn a return on its assets of 8 percent or return on its invested capital including debt and equity of 8 percent now let's combine some of these ratios and one more into the DuPont analysis calculation the DuPont analysis focuses on return on equity which we determined previously is 14 percent and it decomposes return on equity into some important components the first one is the leverage ratio recall that the leverage ratio is the inverse of the equity financing ratio so if we just scoot up here a little bit we can see the equity financing ratio is 37 percent if we invert 37 percent we get a leverage ratio sometimes called a leverage multiplier of 2.69 the second component ratio of the DuPont analysis is the asset turnover which we calculated earlier as 1.52 the third component ratio is a profit margin which we just calculated as 5 percent and finally the fourth component is the debt per burden which we haven't calculated up until now but which is calculated as 0.64 I'll leave it to you to see how the debt burden ratio was calculated from information on the income statement. Now, if we multiply the four component ratios of the DuPont analysis all together, you can see how that's done here. You can see the formula. We'll get our return on equity calculated of 14 percent and that matches the return on equity that we calculated from directly from the financial statements of 14 percent the 
The utility of the DuPont analysis is that it helps us to understand why executive paper earned a 14% return on equity in 2002. What the analysis tells us is first that executive paper had a fairly large leverage ratio or leverage multiplier. 2.69 as a leverage multiplier corresponds, if we scoot up here a minute, to a debt financing ratio of 63%, so and an equity financing ratio of 37%. So one interpretation is that much of the result, let's say a good result in terms of return on equity for executive paper was due to the fact that they used quite a bit of financial leverage. A second explanation for their result is that they achieved an asset turnover of 1.52. In the organizations that I'm familiar with, that is in healthcare organizations, an asset turnover of 1.52 is actually fairly high. That is to say, um, a, a hospital, for example, that can um, generate $1.52 in revenue for every dollar invested in assets is doing quite well. In other industries, an asset turnover of 1.52 might be considered low or average. A third explanation for executive paper's 14% return on equity is that they earned a profit margin of 5%, or they were able to convert 5% of their revenues into um, profits for owners and interest payments for debt suppliers. Quite obviously, if they were able to do better in terms of profit margin, for example, by raising sales by um, being able to charge higher prices, their return on equity would have improved. And finally, executive paper was able to earn a 14% return on equity by employing a debt burden or bearing a debt burden of 0.64. A debt burden of 0.64 indicates that 64% of executive paper's profits were absorbed by interest expense. There's actually a trade-off in terms of effect on return on equity between the leverage ratio and the debt burden. A firm that uses more financial leverage or more debt financing will enjoy a higher leverage multiplier, but that firm will also incur a higher debt burden. So the comparison that the firm needs to make in its DuPont analysis is the contribution that's made by the leverage ratio and the loss that's generated by the debt burden. In the case of executive paper, the leverage ratio more than outweighs the debt burden, so that the use of financial leverage in general for executive paper has increased the return on equity. So as a first step in the financial planning process, the firm typically looks at its historical financial performance and its financial position. Likely it uses some financial ratio analysis. It might use a DuPont analysis. And it gets a sense of how it's been able to do historically that serves to frame what it might be able to do in the future. The second step in the financial planning process is to define the firm's debt policy. Now we spent a lot of time in some previous sessions on the determinants of the optimal debt financing and equity financing ratios for the firm. So I won't go back over that ground here. 
let's just say as an example that we're going to be carrying through in developing a financial plan that the firm determines that its optimal equity financing ratio is 0.4. In addition to specifying the long-term financing ratios or the optimal amount of debt and equity to finance the assets of the firm, the firm needs to determine its target current ratio or essentially its debt policy with respect to short-term viability. For the example firm in question, let's say that they've established a target current ratio of 2, which means that they want $2 in current assets for every $1 in current liabilities. Step 3 in the financial planning process is to determine the asset requirements of the firm going forward. Taking this step actually requires a prior decision, which is what is the financial planning horizon of the firm? In my discussions with chief financial officers, I've learned that firms use a range of planning horizons. The range that I identified in my discussions was anywhere from 30 days to 30 years. But the most common planning horizons employed seem to be either three years or five years. In the example we'll develop, let's say the firm has a five-year planning horizon. And over the next five years, the firm has a business strategy that requires the firm add $1.3 billion in fixed assets, that is, plant and equipment. Over the next five years, it expects to depreciate off about a quarter of a billion dollars in terms of depreciation expense and other write-offs. This quarter of a billion dollars reflects the value of assets that the firm has or will have, but that it won't fi have to finance in the sense that these assets will no longer be on the balance sheet as net plant property and equipment. Finally, over the next five years, let's say that the business strategy of the firm calls for an additional $200 million in cash and other working capital, let's say inventories, etc. If we sum these three components, we get a net additional capital requirement of $1.25 billion that the firm says it needs to support its business strategy over the next five years. The fourth step in the financial planning process is for, for the firm to evaluate the financing options for the asset requirements that it just specified. In the example that we'll go through, the firm actually determines that it needs additional equity in the form of about $540 million that it hopes to generate from retained earnings. It might also want to think about additional stock sales. And the firm expects to add debt to its balance sheet in the form of $620 million in long-term debt and $90 million in short-term debt. Now let's see how we go from the firm's current balance sheet to its balance sheet in five years by accommodating the new asset requirements and new financing options. We're going to use Executive Paper Corporation as our example firm. The heart of the financial planning process is to develop a pro forma balance sheet five years out. So let's say that Executive Paper is 
at the year 2002 or the end of the end of the year 2002 and it has a balance sheet that's described here in column D. We've already done the financial ratio analysis of this balance sheet and executive papers income statement and we've gotten a sense of how well executive paper has been performing in the past. Over here in column K we're going to put the additions to the current balance sheet that we need to make to arrive at our target balance sheet in the year 2007. So let's go back and look at the current balance sheet and focus first on the assets. Executive paper has 1.45 billion dollars in assets composed of 900 million dollars in current assets and 550 million dollars in fixed assets. Now our business strategy calls for an increase in working capital of 200 million dollars. So I'm just going to put that here on the current asset line. And then if we add the increase, the required increase in working capital and cur or current assets to the amount of current assets we have in the year 2002, we get a target current asset amount or total in 2007 of $1.1 billion. Now let's look at fixed assets. In 2002, executive paper has a billion dollars in fixed assets. Our asset requirements call for an increase in fixed assets of $1.3 billion, giving us a total target plant property and equipment in 2007 of $2.3 billion. But we also noted that we are going to be able to depreciate off $250 million over the next five years. So we add that amount to our current accumulated depreciation of $450 million so that on our balance sheet in the year 2007 we'll have accumulated depreciation of $700 million. The net of gross plant property and equipment and accumulated depreciation is a 1.6 billion dollar net fixed asset amount. And if we add fixed assets to current assets, we arrive at a target total asset uh, assets of 2.7 billion dollars in the year 2007. So these numbers map out our asset requirements five years into the future in order to achieve our, the goals of our strategic plan. Note that we have to grow our total assets from $1.45 billion to $2.7 billion in five years. How are we going to finance all of these assets. Let's look at our financing sources, the liabilities and shareholder equity portion of the balance sheet. Currently we have 460 million dollars in current liabilities, we have 450 million dollars in long-term debt and 540 million dollars in shareholders equity for a total financing of $1.45 million matching our total asset structure. Now there are several ways that we might be able to go from $1.45 million in financing to $2.7 million in financing. 
but we need to adhere to our target financing ratios. Recall that step two of the financial planning process was to determine our optimal capital structure and to determine our target current ratio. Now our op optimal capital structure defined an equity financing ratio of 0.4. That means that we want to finance 40 percent of our total assets with equity. So what we can do is to go down here to our shareholders equity cell in the year 2007 and to get this number we need to multiply total assets by 0.4. Notice that's exactly what I've done. I have a formula here which says that shareholders equity in 2007 has to equal assets in 2007 times 0.4. So we have one of our numbers for the financial structure in the year 2007. The second one I want to achieve is or calculate is the target current liabilities amount. Our debt policy indicated that we want two dollars in current assets for every one dollar in current liabilities. So to determine the amount that we can have in this cell or the current liabilities in 2007 we can multiply our current asset target of 1.1 billion dollars by 0.5 and notice that's exactly what I've done to calculate the target current liabilities amount. I took current assets times 0.5 to give us a target current liabilities of 550 million dollars. The last piece of our financing puzzle is to determine the amount of long-term debt in our financial structure. To determine this number, what we need to do is to calculate the difference between total assets, current liabilities, and equity. That is to say, what we're going to do here is to come up with a number, a plug number, that makes the balance sheet actually balance. So we have to finance $2.7 million in assets, and we've already determined that we're going to do that partly with shareholders' equity in the amount of $1.08 billion, and partly in the form of current liabilities in the amount of $550 million. The rest is the $1.07 million that we need in long-term debt. Now let's talk a little bit about why it's okay to come up with a plug number here. Why is it okay to determine the long-term debt amount that makes the balance sheet balance? In order to see that it's okay to do what we just did, you have to think about the criteria for financial viability. Recall in a previous slide that we said the key to financial viability for the firm is to be able to grow equity. We noted that if a firm can grow equity, then it can raise debt on good terms and at low rates. And if it can grow equity and raise debt, it can acquire the assets it needs to support its strategic plan. So the beginning of that series of if statements is, can the firm grow equity? Now this financial planning process essentially says, we have a target amount of equity here of $1.08 billion. And if we can achieve that amount of equity, then according to our determination of optimal capital structure, we're able to raise that amount of debt that is $1.07 billion of debt, in long-term debt, on good terms, 
and we're able to support $550 million in short-term debt or current liabilities on good terms. So we've developed a target financing structure for executive paper in 2007 consisting of 40% equity and 60% debt to support $2.7 billion in assets. Now we have to ask the question, is this financial plan feasible? The key to financial plan feasibility is asking the question or answering the question, is it possible to grow equity from $540 million in 2002 to $1.08 billion in 2007? Because we know if we can get that much additional equity, then we can get this much debt on good terms and we can support the assets that we need. So the feasibility test is really a growth in equity test. So what we need to do next is to determine the required return on equity that's implicit in this financial plan and then to assess whether we think it's feasible. The required ROE calculation is actually a calculation of an internal rate of return. The firm is going to invest $540 million in the year 2002 and it wants to come out at the end of 2007 with $1.08 billion. So if we just create an analysis that has minus 540 in year zero, in this case 2002, no cash flows in the interim, in the interim years, and then a plus 1.080 in year five or year 2007, we can calculate the internal rate of return that's necessary to go from 540 to 1080. And notice what I've done is to use the IRR function and to highlight the cells that, that correspond to the cash flows for years 0 through 5. And the result is a required return on equity of 15%. So what this result tells us is that for executive paper to achieve its long-range long financial plan, it needs to grow equity at a compound rate of 15% per year for the next five years. So now what executive paper has to do is to assess the, fe assess the feasibility of achieving a 15% return on equity, and it can do so by thinking about what it's been able to do historically in terms of return on equity. So let's scoot over to our DuPont analysis with our ratios here, and recall that in 2002, executive paper earned a 14% return on equity. The return that's required over the next five years is a rate of 15 percent per year. So what executive paper needs to do is to assess whether it's going to be able to do better each year or at least on average over the next five years than it was able to do in the year 2002. And one way for the company to think about whether it can do better is to go back to the components of the DuPont analysis and to think about whether any of these components can be improved over the numbers that we found for 2002. The last step in the financial planning process is to integrate the information that we just generated into a management control structure for the firm. 
The final step in the financial planning process is to integrate the information we just developed into a management control structure. Note that the required return on equity from the long-range financial plan informs the determination of the R sub E in the weighted average cost of capital calculation. Specifically, if the firm determines that it needs to grow equity at 15% per year in order to make its long-range financial plan work or to achieve its strategic objectives, it might want to impose an R sub E in the weighted average cost of capital calculation of 15%. Then, proposed projects are evaluated at the weighted average cost of capital that reflects a required growth in equity with appropriate risk adjustment. If a particular project generates a positive net present value, that project generates enough cash to cover its operating costs, cover its debt service, and grow equity at a rate that is sufficient to make the financial plan work. And yes, that is fairly cool.